This is a cheddar. H. H. Schmoked. Looks good so far. This is my fall lettuce garden and let and fall cucumber. Huh? Why do I keep hurting myself? I don't know. I just stubbed three of my toes on the El Camino tire. I'm sorry. Do not come over here, Turkey. I don't want you on this. Because we have such a large garden and milk goats that give a lot of milk, not having a pig, not having a pig would be very wasteful. I can put whey on the garden. I could put it in compost. I could take vegetables and put them in the compost. But how does that benefit my family? It really doesn't. The way that I compost is in the hotbeds. You're not gonna be able to hear anything over me. Okay, so this is real life with pigs. Because we live on a farm with milk goats and we have a really big garden and chickens who sometimes hide their nests, if we didn't have pigs, it would be very wasteful as far as where our food scraps go. We don't feed the pigs garbage. We don't feed them raw meat. We don't feed them bad food, but we do feed them kitchen scraps. We feed them zucchini. Um, what else do we feed them? Old tomatoes. When the pear tree has a windfall of pears, we feed them the pears. Um, and so these are a really important part of the system that we use to make sure there's no waste, but also so that there's abundance for everybody. These are the American guinea hogs. We have Tom Tom right there, and then we have Thomasina right there. And when you're feeding an American guinea hog, the blessing is they don't eat very much. In fact, you cannot feed them very much, or else they will get really fat, they won't be able to walk, their little legs will break. Um, so the blessing is they don't eat much. The curse is they don't get very big. Previously, when we first got them, I was feeding them like a normal pig. I was giving them whey and food scraps from the kitchen on top of their regular feed. And she started to waddle and like breathe deeply if she got up at all. And the last three weeks, she has been on a diet where she only gets one cup of feed, non-GMO scratch feed a day, and then an occasional zucchini or sugar beets or something like that. And she looks so much better. He was getting to the point where the rolls over his eyes made it so he couldn't see. We bought her bread, but then it turned out she wasn't bread. And so we're taking her back to the lady we bought her from to get rebred, and we're also buying a little boar. Tom Tom is castrated. He's ready to butcher, but he would not be a father because he doesn't have testicles. So. This is the pen. It was an experimental garden. I didn't have enough manure or enough mulch in here for it to be a huge success, but I still tried it. And then when it wasn't a success, I just put the pigs in here. Over there is their pond. It has a hose in it so that it is automatic. We just turn the hose on from somewhere else. And that's their shade. They also have a waterproof IBC tote that has a, a hole cut in the other side so they can get into it in case of rain. The nice thing is, is that these guys don't go under fences. We don't have an electrical wire in here or anything. They do root, so when I put them out on pasture, they have taken um, the pasture and turned it into a little bit of a minefield. So we have them in here instead of having them on pasture. They will eat hay, however. We can't give them very much hay because it's high in protein. So we're just kind of feeling our way through. 
I in 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 our situation, I'm going to start breeding because they are they do take a long time to age to get big enough to butcher. Which means that with how little they eat, if I have a little brood of these pigs running around all the time, that's not a bad thing. And we can just butcher them as it's convenient and as we run out of port without it breaking our budget. The reason that we have the Duroc Hampshire cross as well as the American guinea hog is that while we're figuring out a breeding program for the American guinea hog, we need pork. So these two, we did get gilts just in case we really love them and suddenly we're really rich and we can afford to feed a full grown pig. These guys, by the time they're at 250, 275, 300 pounds, they're going through a bag of feed about every three, maybe four days. And that's a lot of feed. I cannot put my American guinea hogs in with these pigs because with the amount of feed I put in for these pigs, my American guinea hogs would get fat and lardy and they would die. So I have to keep them separate. They get very little food. These guys get as much food as they can put away. One thing that we do is we feed them their hay inside their shelter. They don't poop in their shelter. They sleep in it. And any of their hay, their alfalfa that they don't eat, turns into really nice soft bedding for them. It keeps them warm in the winter. I really like these semi-transparent shelters because in the winter it acts a little bit like a greenhouse and keeps them a little bit warmer. With our big pigs, we have a much sturdier swimming pool. It's, um, it's actually meant to be a sandbox and it's much thicker, much, much thicker plastic. So we drilled holes in the side and put a string through and attached it to the fence. And the reason we give it to them when they're little is to teach them that they can't flip it. If you teach them when they're young that they can't do something, then when they're big and they could do it, they won't realize they could do it, so they won't. So a big 300 pound pig could totally flip this pond, but our little 50 pound pigs that we started with couldn't. So when they're 300 pounds, they won't flip it. This is how we give them their drinking water and their bath water to keep them cool. And we have a hose that runs in it all the time because pigs drink a lot of water. We have it attached to a four-way splitter at our pump. We just turn it on, it waters all the pigs at the same time, and then we turn it off. And it works pretty good. One thing we have found is that I've heard a lot of people um, like Joel Salatin say that if you put pigs in with trees, it'll kill the trees. But ours has been the opposite experience. When our pigs come through and they graze and root around the bottoms of our trees, we have more sprouts come up from the roots of the trees, which is what we want. So anywhere that I want trees, that's where I put my pigs. But you get a better view of their shelter. They need a lot more hay in there. Hey, this one is ginger. Hey, pig, pig. And that one is sugar. And this is how our feeder works. There's two tea posts and holes drilled in the side of a barrel that it's attached to so that they can't knock it over. It doesn't matter how big these pigs get, they cannot knock it over and it's right next to the fence so all we have to do is just put their feet in. and they take turns pretty good. They get very aggravated about it but a little bit of competition is not a big deal. We put enough food in there that uh, they can both come in and get enough food. Okay, here I am standing in front of a peach tree and a plum tree. These are two that I'm really careful about how I feed to my pigs and that's because they have a pet. So, uh, where with pears and apples and soft fruits, I can just give them to the pigs. If they have a pet, I pit them first. We lost uh, one of our first pigs that we ever raised like 10 years ago because I left a pit in a peach and she ate it instead of um, 
instead of spitting it out or it, it just got blocked in her intestinal tract is what we figured and she died. So peaches, sorry, peaches, plums, pit them first. Um, my understanding is that with things like acorns and other kinds of nuts, the pigs should be able to crack through the shell and eat them. But I kind of wonder if maybe they need uh, practice at it on something that's really soft. And I'd, if I had a million pigs, I probably would feel more comfortable with experimenting with that kind of thing. But since I only have a few and I don't have them breeding yet, I'm just really careful about anything that, like that. It doesn't make sense to me because it's not like they eat rocks but apparently with the peaches, they really did think that it was food. This is a Stanley prune. They're not um, gushy and watery like a lot of plums. They're very firm. <coughs> Pardon me. They're g very good for dehydrating. There's not a lot of moisture in them, but they're very flavorful. And I have two of them. These are little baby plums. They're coming up and what I'm gonna do is this next spring I will start grafting the peaches on to all the plums that I have on the property. I don't know how well you can see these guys. There's a good one. Peach. And we are zone four. I was just very strategic about where I planted it. Oh, we are getting so stinking close. All right, here I have a golden currant, I have rose hips, an apricot tree, and then um, a root sucker that come, came off of the grafted root of the apricot tree. So I do not put my pigs underneath my fruit trees. The reason for that is that with a normal tree, you've got roots that go down pretty deep. And that's about it, down pretty deep. They have some here. But with fruit trees, what happens is they have their down deep roots, but then they have very shallow roots that spread out like this, just under the surface of the soil. Any kind of rooting, any kind of disturbance to those roots, Yes, we don't live in the middle of nowhere. We do have traffic. Fruit trees, their fruit feeding roots are near the surface. They're just a couple inches under the surface and they spread out horizontally along the surface, just under the surface of the soil. So they're, they're more, if you thought of like a blanket that was spread out directly under the tree, those would be the roots that feed the fruit. They have two separate types of roots, the deep roots and then the fruit feeding roots. If your pigs go in and do any kind of rooting, they disturb those fruit feeding roots and then you don't have any fruit. So um, we have ducks and geese that keep the grass out from the fruit orchard. And then in turn, if the ducks or geese, see if I can show you some of them. All right, those are some of, these are the front birds. We have three geese and then many muscovies, probably about 10 muscovies up here. And they keep the grass really short and anywhere that they have water, they go in and they weed very carefully. But um, they only weed where there's direct water. So where a pig would go and make a wallow and root everything up and then just wallow around in it, the ducks and the geese go in and they nibble the grass, they eat a little bit of weeds. Um, but the other thing I wanted to say is that with, with ducks and geese and chickens and stuff, sometimes they'll hide a nest and the eggs won't be good for human consumption, but they're still great for pigs. And so if we find a bad nest, we float test them, make sure they're not actually nasty, and then we'll feed them shell and all to the pigs and the pigs love them. In this space, we have bush cherries and rose hips and elderberries, Siberian pea shrubs, honeyberries, honeyberries, Saskatoons. We have a lot of stuff in here. All right, this is our garden. 
And some vegetables people get really frustrated with throughout the year because they feel like there's too much abundance or too much comes on all at once. Some of those things are Swiss chard. Um, there is zucchini. Sometimes people feel that way about their tomatoes. So I want to show you why I have pigs. I have four rows of potatoes. I have one 50 foot long row of beets. I have one and a half rows of sunflowers, um, four rows of corn, one row of beans, and, and then I have a massive row of tomatoes and zucchini. So the things that go to the pigs the most are zucchini. And when I have trimmings off the beets, I give them to the pigs, the beets. But um, there's a massive amount of food here that I can't get to all the time. The rabbits will eat the Swiss chard or they'll eat the tops of the beets. That's what the rabbits will eat. The goats will eat the stalks from the corn once we're done with the corn. Um, but any little teeny tiny thing that just doesn't really have somebody to eat it, that goes to the pigs and it goes to the pigs fresh. So if we have potatoes we cut up and I feel like um, they're just maybe a little too small to roast or do something with. Sometimes those go in the pig bucket. If I have teeny tiny beets that I don't want to clean up because there's just not much to them, I feed that to the pigs. And um, pretty much the same thing just goes for everything. The pigs are kind of the cleaner upper. The rabbits are a little dainty about what they'll eat. The goats will eat the stalks of corn. The goats will eat fall pumpkin. What, kitty? Come here. your belly you got a little hernia um, the goats will eat the corn stalks and then they'll eat fall pumpkins um, I am and oh and then I make treats for the goats by dehydrating the beets so I have sugar beets and I grate them up and I dehydrate those for the goats but any of those bits and pieces that the goats won't eat themselves what do you want? have you not been fed today um, those I give to the pigs and then you saw earlier in the year when we had the turkeys in here eating grasshoppers. So once everything was about knee height and the turkeys couldn't, couldn't hurt it. What, kitty? He's being so careful not to use his claws. You're jumping at me without using claws and I really appreciate it. Um, he's trying to climb me without claws. <laughs> so we still have nine tenths of our beet row left still to go. And um, I'm not sure how all that's going to go because there's just so much. We have plenty to eat. We have plenty to give to everybody else. So now I'm just kind of babbling about how productive the garden is. Um, even if you don't have a garden, just keeping your food scraps that are nice, nice food scraps, you can, you can totally support an American guinea hog because they can only need a couple of uh, cups worth of feed a day without getting too fat. You can totally do it. Uh, would my chickens eat food scraps? Yes, they would to a degree, but I don't want to have to sort it out for them. And anything big and crunchy and big, like a mouthful of food, like a beet um, piece, my chickens are not going to be able to eat that. They, they don't have teeth. So, um, really it's about having layers. It's about having so many different types of life on your property that everybody can use all the things that need to be eaten and use it efficiently. That's really what it's all about. And pigs are the ultimate efficiency creator. I wish you guys could see the cutest cat that I ever had. <laughs> oh my gosh, he's so cute. I should go feed him. Okay, so that is my little rant about American guinea hogs. Again, we also do have big meat pigs that we're, we're um, going to butcher while we're waiting to see if we can get our hogs bred. If we can get them bred, then we probably won't keep Durox or other big pigs. But for now, I have redundancy. I have my breeders and I have my eaters. And um, hopefully that was helpful to you. Um, I should... Yes. Yes. I see you. Are you just so hungry? They just haven't fed you. Um, hey, Kaya, did you feed the cats? Can you feed them? Okay, you better go eat. She's going to go feed you. All right, so done with pigs for the moment, I believe.
windfalls are great for pigs garden produce that's extra is great for pigs if you overfeed them too much on grain they're not as interested in garden produce so we kind of try to balance it we have a certain rate a certain amount of grain feed that we give them in a day and then the rest of the day we take them away we take them garden stuff we take them kitchen scraps and that way that's why it's not as expensive um, if I was to however fill up a hopper sorry I'm allergic to cats if I was to feed up just a big hopper self feeder for pigs they would be eating grain all day long if however what I do is give them a certain amount of feed that has grain in it in the morning and at night the rest of the day I bring them whey I bring them zucchini I bring them beets I bring them kitchen scraps and that's what I bring them the rest of the day so they have a massive variety of food that they're eating and they don't just taste like oily greasy corn and soy they taste like zucchini <laughs> okay thanks for coming we'll talk to you later all right kitty let's go see what we've got for you this is the food for the pigs they've already had one of these today it has a corn that we were testing to see for doneness some old beets carrot peelings um, sourdough bread uh, water and then this is the compost we keep the two separate but the American guinea hogs can survive pretty much on just scraps we have food for them we give them food but um, if we didn't have pellets because we give them a lot of goat's milk and they eat pretty much what we eat they're just fine without so they're very very cost-effective so if I have something that the pigs are not necessarily going to want to eat like for instance raw zucchini it's not going to be their favorite thing in the world what I'll do is I'll get some kind of cooking liquid that's very flavorful and I will take a pot and put any leftovers in the kitchen that I have here I had a little bit of leftover butter and what I'm going to do is boil my pig food and I'm going to salt my pig food and right now I have a glut of eggs so I'll probably put some eggs in there so this was a bottle of beans I think for making tacos they will flavor the zucchini and I don't give the pigs rotten food ever and I'm very careful not to give them pesticide um, laden foods things like skins from conventional fruits and vegetables because we had a very scary time where we gave them some uh, watermelon rinds and they almost died and so we don't give them anything conventional anymore it all is homegrown all right so before you feed it to the pigs you have to let it cool down because they will try to eat it when it's still boiling and then they won't want to eat food again when you bring it out they won't be able to trust you so make sure to cool it down before you try to feed it to the pigs. If I am doing a lot of cooking for the pigs, I will use a pressure cooker because then it's a five minute heat up and then you just turn it off. When it's on the wood stove, I use one of the other pans, but in order to keep it economical, this two gallons of milk is going to turn into two gallons of whey plus two pounds of cheese. The whey then goes to the pigs. I try really hard to give the pigs whey instead of milk so that every part gets used. The pigs don't need all the protein solids and the fat that's in the cheese. So this is some of what's left after I make cheese. This was from mozzarella, so it's kind of a different color than our other whey off of our cheese. This one is gonna be more tangy but that's what it is i also made ricotta not just mozzarella so it has a little bit of a yellow tint because i put that in for the ricotta this is the ricotta ready to go into a jar we are getting four we're getting four gallons of milk a day from three goats so I make a cheese bat every other day. All right, this is our smokehouse. It's actually built out of an old hot tub gazebo and then we framed it in. And um, it's built from old wood from the deck. Because we do salt curing and we leave the skin on our pigs when we butcher them, 
we have to have somewhere to hang them while they age and also we have to have somewhere to smoke them. So that's what this is. It didn't cost us anything. Um, so I'm going to show you the inside. I don't know how clean it is right now because John was the last one to use it and um, he's been trying different smoking things but we cannot butcher our pigs before November because the outside ambient air temperature is not cool enough. Not quite. And we don't want to be doing it in October because you might still have a few bugs. So that's about when we can do it is once our temperatures get into the 50s during the day, you know, and 40s, 30s at night, that's when we can start using the smokehouse. This is a space where we keep the baby pigs when they first get here. It doesn't look so great right now um, because the birds have been in here instead and we had rabbits on that spot there. But this is where we keep them because they can't get through and it lets them get used to being here and eating way and being happy. So this used to be a deck. It used to be a large deck and we took all the wood from the top and turned it into a smokehouse. This is my open air dehydrator. It currently has zucchini in it. All right, there we go. Smokehouse extraordinaire. We had the plastic up to hold the um, smoke in a little better. And then Paige is tanning some rabbit hides in here. And then we have our winter's garlic hung from the ceiling. We've had people ask, how it is that we keep our cats from eating our birds um, or being, you know, a, a bad thing to our animals. And the way that we do that is that we, that yes, they go eat uh, mice and voles and that kind of thing, but we also give them cat food and they have goat's milk. And when we butcher animals, they get the intestines from that. And if we have a carcass from an animal, we give them the carcass from an animal after we've eaten it and when it goes in the hot bed. So they're never hungry and they know that we'll feed them and that eventually the food that they want will be available. Um, and so they're good cats. They are really respectful of the other life on the farm because they're not fat. I mean, you can see they're not fat kitties, but they are definitely loved and fed. Um, this is the alfalfa hay we feed to the goats, the sheep, the pigs, and the rabbits. If I can get enough of this in stock, then the animals won't starve in the winter, if, even if we don't have bagged feed. <laughs> this is Midge and Heidi, and they are mowing our front yard. They're much better at it than goats. Goats are not very efficient grazers. They don't get things down very close to the ground. So we're really grateful for our sheep this year because it means I didn't have to get out a weed whacker for any part of the property. I just had to fence it in. Hi little swallows. You're so funny. So, there we go. She goes to the breeder in three weeks. Huh. 